Elvis Presley, Roy Orbison, Neil Diamond, Jerry Garcia, The Carpenters, Billy Joel. That is legendary. And this interview is with none other than Ronnie Tut, the drummer that played with all of those artists. This was actually my first interview to ever do, so I'm extremely nervous. And it, it happened so many years ago, so the quality is not as great as, as my videos usually are. I felt I wanted to post this just because I, I recently watched the Elvis movie. It was so incredible, and I thought, man, I got to have Ronnie Tut into the studio. He got to talk to my students, and I've got this interview that I've never shared with the channel. So, hopefully you get something from this. This is Ronnie Tut, an ultimate legend in the drumming industry, and one of the kindest men you could ever meet. Hopefully, you enjoy the interview. Now, before we get started, give them just a little bit of a, um, of some background on yourself as far as, as the work you've done, how long you've been uh, kind of gigging professionally and, and some of the artists you've played with. They know some of the background. Some of the guys have researched this quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but but just go ahead and, and kind of tell them a little bit about yourself well, before we get started. Well, originally from Texas and uh, spent most of my years there. Went to a college there at North University of North Texas. And um, when th then I got into the jingle business and on a staff position there. With a studio? Studios, a okay. jingle business where we did commercials, industrial films, uh, product commercials, you know, real jingles. <laughs> <laughs> the, Station the, IDs, right. which is really great because it's like a college course because you have to learn how to play all kind of styles of music. Right. It's really important, you know, so it's like going to college again. So uh, anyway, then uh, back to Dallas for a little while and then... Uh, I got a chance to audition with uh, Elvis Presley in uh, 1969. Okay. And I went out to the West Coast, and I was really wanting to go out there anyway because uh, as opposed to Nashville at that time, it was the land of milk and honey. L.A. was where music was really happening. Okay. And uh, so I thought, well, that's a great, great way to break into L.A. because everybody wanted to see Elvis in Vegas, so that was our first gig. Really? Yeah. Was so, was in Vegas. Now, yeah. now when, what time period were you with? Elvis that was, was 1969. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty interesting time because everyone, every artist, every entertainer, movie star, on and on, came to see Elvis perform. Right. Because he hadn't played live in 10 years. Right. So it was pretty exciting for everybody, and every night was filled with that kind of, you know... Excitement. Ex excitement, to say the least. Okay, uh, George Rittenhouse. He he asked. Uh, he said, "With all of the great acts you've worked with, who was the mo who gave you the most room to put yourself into the show?" He said that uh, he actually became a fan, uh, or you became one of his favorite drummers, but playing behind Elvis because he's, uh, you were so great at giving that show that that extra punch that it needed. And so I guess he's asking, you know, out of the artists you've worked with, uh, who's given you the most room to to kind of put your own spin on the on what they do. Well, the beauty of, of the Elvis uh, relationship was that he never told me what to play. And uh, one of the first things he did say to me was, uh, now don't try to play these old, old you know, rock songs that, that, that were you know, mostly synonymous with him. Right. Uh, like they were done, like their records. So don't play them like the rec, play them like you play them. Really? So, he gave, so you... he gave me free license to do whatever I wanted to do. That's great. So, yeah. But it, it called on every little bit of experience I had because uh, our music varied from a small rhythm section, uh, from rock to country to uh, having a big band, big orchestra for the big ballads and things like that, and, you know, full brass section, right? you know, harp, the whole bit, you know. Right. <laughs> so, and so it... it you had to you had to call on all the experience that I had gathered all those years playing with different kinds of music in to the studios. That. To That's be amazing able to do that, that you could you know the same thing that you would do with a small group format. You'd have to take it to an orchestral thing. And yeah. I know from uh, before I moved here, I actually worked with a lot of the uh, Mississippi Symphony Orchestra, Mobile Symphony Orchestra, yeah. and I was kind of the go-to um, <clears throat> kit drummer because they don't uh, conductors don't love kit drummers because nope. <laughs> we can we can take the orchestra from them real quick. Yes. And so, how was that working with? Did you ever have to work with um, with a show you've already got planned? Did you ever have to work with a conductor? Uh, well, and, fortunately. Uh, uh, after the first year or two, uh, a good pal of mine, Joe Gersio, be, w who was had the orchestra at the Hilton Hotel at that mm -hmm. time, and uh, he and I became close friends and still are to this day. 
and uh, we just we just worked it together. We worked it together. He watched me. I watched him. Right. It was just a good communication that we had. And, of course, we were all watching Elvis. Right, because you, you <laughs> cued off of what he oh, did, right? Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And that, that brings me to, I uh, actually got a, another good question. He said, you know, we're all trying to perfect our craft. He said, is there ever a time that you dropped a beat or missed a cue and didn't come in on one? Um, in other words, does that even happen at that level? Like, do you just... Oh, of course it does. <laughs> <laughs> Of course it does. We're only human or something like that. I always tell people, you know, you just try to get better at covering for it. You know, yeah. you still miss cues. Well, it's... the old joke in the studio, for example, is if you make a mistake, you make it twice. You <laughs> make then... it again. So, hey, I meant to do that. <laughs> it's know? part of the song. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh... Yeah. Yeah. We used to play around and do, do different sound effects and anything to try to kind of make it light and keep it easy and keep it fun. Right. Uh, and. And he would try to do things to us, like Elvis, for example, to stump the band, so to speak. He said, "Just give me an E chord," and all of a sudden we had to start playing. And whether we knew the song or not, <laughs> <laughs> you had to play it. We had to play it. Yeah, fortunately, we did. We knew most of them. So. Um, now that's a, that would bring me to what you're currently actually doing, um, because uh, Ronnie is actually out with just to let you know, you know, kind of the level that he functions on. He's out uh, playing dual drums. I'm guessing with the Elvis big. What are they officially called? The Elvis big screen. <clears throat> well, uh, the big screen thing is 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 me only. Okay, it's but, you only. But we we work with uh, a couple of artists. One in particular out of Austria, uh, a guy named Dennis Jail, who is not a a tribute artist. He doesn't look anything like Elvis, and he right. didn't try to sing like him. And he's just a lover of Elvis's music, as the uh, as the Austrians and the Viennese Viennese are. Uh -huh. And uh, so we we've been playing there for eleven years on wow. around, around January and Elvis's birthday time. And uh, it's it's great. It's a great city to hang out in. It's just just absolutely gorgeous. And he's a really really nice guy. And and we've become very good friends. And and. Uh, I've had not been able to do it because of my obligation with Neil uh -huh. Diamond. Uh, this is my 31st year with him. I, I, lo I love how he just refers to him because of Neil, you know, yeah. like, like, oh, yeah, Neil, well, yeah, I know that we had coffee the other day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, he, he's that kind of a guy. So, uh, so anyway, uh, when I haven't been able to do those, Paul was kind enough to uh, clear his schedule and, and cover me. And then it got to be where it was – a thing where everybody got along so well, we thought, well, let's try two drummers on some things. So, uh, right, and it's pretty powerful. It's Is pretty, it? It's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. and but, uh, and he's talking about Paul Lyme, by by the yeah. way, the one of the the premier session drummers here in town. And I had I have a question about that. What's that? You know, both you and Paul having worked behind larger artists and, and whatnot, you're both going to have very strong opinions about where things should go or about um, how to drive the band, because it really does come from the drumming position as far as driving it and sometimes giving a direction. How do you know when to give and take with, with another strong personality like that? Well, I think you just have to be sensitive of it, and you have to develop very good listening habits. Just like when you play with a bass player, it's, it, it's, a, it's a marriage in the best sense of, right. of, of of listening together, and you have to do the same, even more so when you're playing with another percussionist. So uh, whether it be a set drummer or, or a percussionist, right. so, there's a there's a certain amount of space you have to leave for that yeah, other person and yeah. think about. Uh, yeah, because otherwise you got train wrecks. You got, of, <laughs> you got a lot of conflict. It could easily turn into that. You know. Um, Here's a question from Marcus out of Texas. We've got a couple of Marcuses, just so you know. Um, do you get called to play so often because people want your style or because you have the flexibility to adapt to theirs? Well, I think it's a little bit of both, mm -hmm. really. Uh, I've had producers or artists take me uh, you know, and say things at the beginning of a session like, well, we called you because we want, want you to do what you do. Right. And you just wonder, well, what it is? What is it that I do? <laughs> Who do that voodoo? That, you know? <laughs> so, I I never really know what to say when they do that because I've had one artist that uh, I won't mention any names that uh, took me aside and said, "Yeah, man, I, we really want you to do something to these to these charts, to these this music and all of that." And and every time I do something, he'd stop the band and say, uh, "They're at bar 14." Uh, <laughs> There's, there doesn't supposed to be anything there. <laughs> and he kept busting me like that all, all through the, the rehearsal. And finally, I just 
gave up and just said, hey, I'm just going to play exactly what's here. What's there? Yeah, yeah I forget the whole spiel that he gave me in the <laughs> beginning. You know? Now, I get asked all the time, um, so much so that I actually made a... Um, a three lesson series on how to read music. Um, now with the, because so many guys say, you know, it's just music, get in there, play it. If I got the recording, I can learn it. And I said, well, it opens up so many doors for you, uh, to be able to teach yourself. Not only that, you know, you can take books and things and assimilate the information, right. but also I said, there's countless gigs where I've, you know, they give me a set list of 50, 60 songs and they say we're on Friday. And you know, the only way I'm able to do that is chart that. How important to your career has been, has music reading been? I think very much so uh, at certain times. Right. It's been critical at certain times. There's been times where studio work, for example, and it's usually in studio work. Uh-huh. Uh, as they always say it's 90% boredom and 10% holy terror. <laughs> because <laughs> there's times where I had to do a music score one time uh, for, for film. And everything, it was on two staffs. And all the drum set was on the top staff, and there was a snare drum part written on the second staff. So I had to follow both of them with the full stage of orchestra. Now, I mean, Jeez. these are the days where everything was simul. And, and, right. and, uh, but, I mean, it was that, there, that's the holy terror, 10% right there. <laughs> <laughs> Really had it. So uh, now, having worked in L.A. and then having to work here in Nashville, of course, there's the you know, and a lot of guys might not know about it the the uh, the Nashville number system that yeah. is used here very often. Uh, you go into a studio, you'll get just a sheet with numbers, yeah, um, and you have to know how to read that. You have to know how to chart like that. It's a very it's a quickie way to uh, to actually go through that. And Jim Riley will talk about some about that. He's got a book out on it um, later this month. But um, but tell them the difference between do y'all use a system? Did you use a system? System like that out no everything was notated okay uh, by normal music notes and so forth now which do you prefer well actually what i prefer is uh, the really good arrangers and the really good producers and so forth would have what we call rhythm section charts mm -hmm. and that's all you really see you'll see a chart and it may be five pages long and there again it really creates another issue how do you sit beside your behind your set and still have a music stand up there that has room for five pages and turn and flip yeah all and flip and all it was, it was the deal so uh anyway the, the notation is 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 only for the rhythm section which is when you're doing rhythm section tracks mm -hmm. that's really all you need anyway it right. gives you the the best clue of what's going on the number system Usually they'll mark down some sort of indication of what the rhythm pattern might be. If there's a stop or a kick mm -hmm. somewhere, you know, they'll they'll notate that maybe within the 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 number chart. Right, and I've often gotten charts because I feel uh, coming from um, a jazz background, uh, they would give us rhythm charts just like you're talking about, and I felt like there was so much more space when they gave me that and they didn't give me, whenever I receive, um, I used to do a lot of stage show type stuff. When I received those, I mean, it's notated to the D yeah. what you're going to play. And I always felt very rigid and I would miss, you know, one eighth note in the hi-hat and I'd go, oh, did I just ruin the whole song? You know, right. I'm just missing that high. Yeah, and But it, it, it gave me a clammed up feeling of not being able to stretch out. Any. Yeah, it, it's tough. It, it puts drummers in a situation where your eyes are, are uh, more of the focus, if you will, than than what your ears are, are, are telling you. Right. You know, so you're having to watch instead of listen. Right. And drummers do best when they listen. Open up yeah, their ears. When they open up their ears. I know? can't tell the number of times my teachers would say, get out of the music. They'd say, get your head up. Yeah, <laughs> that's say, right. Learn it and then get your head on it. Learn it, it first, know? yeah. And that, that's some of the most successful recording projects I've ever done were the ones where they had enough time to, uh, to learn the music mm -hmm. and... Uh, and then close your eyes, basically. Right. I used to always try to get to the point where I could close my eyes and, and hear the music and play it. Instead of being so stuck Instead in the chart. Instead of stuck in the chart. Yeah. It's, so let's see here. Let's get another question. Again, from Marcus with a K. Uh, I always uh, kid Marcus because Marcus is in almost every lesson. That I teach. Oh, right. <laughs> and I, I kid him that he's here at 3 in the morning when I get on and he's, hey, is there a lesson right now? <laughs> so, But he's, he's you always better learn. and really committed. Um, Good for him. Let's see here. Let's let me get one of his. Okay, this is kind of a two-part question, so let me read the whole thing. Did you ever have a hard time in the music business? Uh, what helped you coping with your situation, and what took you through them? And did you ever find yourself in a situation where you just wanted to throw the sticks away, go get a nine-to-five, and just say, "Been there, done that. I'm done." Hmm. 
it'll happen as a freelance player those things will happen you know you'll have up and up times where you're so busy you wish you had time off and there'll be times where you have so much time off you wish you know what am, am i ever going to get another gig that right. kind of attitude or situation will come up and you say well why didn't i just take something that's more reliable on a steady basis you know? right but uh i think i think to do well in the music business these days you have to be completely committed uh it, it's nice to be able to uh, have other projects that you can do or maybe even other part-time things, but to, to mainly count on the music business to be your main source of income, there's times when it's very frustrating. There's right. times when you just want to say, I don't know about this. You know? Right. And it's, it's, it's something, I don't mean to interrupt you, it's something that reminds me of, it's something that's, you know, you take something that's so close and personal to you as music, which not only functions on a physical level, but an emotional level, you know, it, yeah. it brings emotions out of people. And then you take that to, <clears throat> to be your sustenance and your income. And, you know, you have kids at home, you have a wife and oh, life, yeah. life happens. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, there's that constant struggle. How have you dealt with, you know, that struggle of, still loving the art form, but also being so frustrated at, it at times because maybe, like you said, maybe it's a famine month. Maybe it's a, you know. Yeah. Well, I think you have to get your priorities straight. Now, I was kind of a, a well, my situation might be different than most guys. Uh, I was married the day before my 21st birthday to a woman who had two children. Uh -huh. So, uh, so you were immediately thrown into, I immediately into <laughs> thrown into parenthood and, and, uh, Ron, to, Ron jumps in with both feet. He yeah, just, <laughs> that's true. And, uh, cause I've raised 10 kids. Wow. Yeah. 10, yeah. 10 of them. Yeah. I have, t I have two and I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I think there's 10 here somewhere. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Be. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I had, I had different perspective uh, right away. I had to think about putting food on the table right, right. away because they, it's funny how those kids just keep eating. You know, and <laughs> they won't stop. They won't stop eating. So anyway, um, that's that's the deal. I, I was fortunate enough to, as I said, land staff situations uh -huh. uh, in studios, and which gave us uh, an income of, of, you know, a monthly income, uh, right. you, some kind of substantial foundation. But yet I was still doing the craft. Right. And, now, and singing, by the way. I and was, singing. That, and that, was, that was another question that we had. Uh, from one of the, the students, they, they were asking, you know, you, you obviously learned other instruments mm -hmm. in addition to the drums or even before the drums. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, how, did, how did that affect your playing as well as I'd like you to tie into because I tell so many people, the more skills you can bring to the table, uh, the better. So if you are able to sing, some guys say, well, I don't sing. And I say, well, you should start. You should at least be able to hit a note and hold that note because yeah. that makes you an added value to yeah. a situation yeah. when you can go, sure, I can hold the third for you right there. And yeah. how is that? How is that? Even if you? you can't, even though you can't physically put it off I and mean, pull it off mentally, you'll be able to relate to music better. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole secret right there. It's what, what, how you can relate to what you're hearing. Right. You know, as opposed to your actual performance of saying, well, I can play violin, so so what when you're playing drums? But right. on the other hand, you may hear some section of violins that inspires you to play something on your instrument that you hear from somewhere else. Yeah, and I, I had a, uh, when I was going through university, I had a piano player that was just a fellow student, and we played in a combo together, and I... I fed off of him more than anybody else. He taught me more um, phrasing and rhythms than anybody else. Go. Just listening to him solo, and and I'd go, how could I kind of make that, but on the drums? You know, yeah, I don't, right. I don't have all those keys, but could I do something yes. that's becomes you become a more if you're listening to a melodic instrument, it helps you become a more melodic player. Right. You know, and there's there's a question that you're talking about. You had. Um, kind of situations where you were brought on staff and I have a lot of questions from we have several students that are teachers we have several students that are um, actually uh, out doing this thing full time and they they this isn't just from any one person so collectively they want to know what were some of the things that you did in the start and still to this day I talk a lot about uh, about conducting yourself in a professional way about networking and about how important that is um, to to your uh, your career in music. What were some things that you did as far as the networking and that kind of things? How did you land those uh, those jobs, and how were you able to keep uh, busy? Shall we say? Well, that's the difficult part about the business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll I'll be the first guy to admit that I'm the the probably one of the worst self promoters you'll ever meet. Right. You know? 
I, I'm, I'm not that guy that's in your face and, hey, get me on it kind of a guy. I'm, I'm you know, I'm just, if anything, I'll, I'll just pass things up until they hit me in the face. Right. And there are some guys that are like that. You know, like there's a, um, a player in town, Rich Redmond, who plays with Jason Aldean. Fantastic player, fantastic person. Uh, but he's very much, uh, he's very good at the, if you ever want to learn self-promotion, yeah. hang out with Rich Redmond because that guy promotes himself. Yep. Uh, but then there's other uh, cats like you that, uh, you know, and I take more of that approach. I'm more of a behind-the-scenes networker than I am uh, yeah, me too. Uh, on top of things. It's usually been through friends. Mm-hmm. You know, through experiences, playing experiences, and you connect with people, and 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 you you, uh, you keep in touch with those people that you connect with. You know, they become friends, and so when people, no matter how good a player you are, uh, when you connect with people in a good in a positive way, it'll open all kinds of possibilities for you. Right. The two major gigs I've ever had in my life, the Elvis gig and the Neil Diamond gig. I mean, the others, there's also similar, similar connections. But those all came because of a friend. Right. That there was another instrument, and not a drummer, but another friend uh, that right. I played music with. And we connected, and when it came time for looking for a drummer or an audition came up, my name came to their mind. Right. So, And that's, you know, I, I tell them so much. Um, I did a whole kind of thing on, on how to make, uh, money as a musician how to how do you do this and that wasn't you know what gigs you should get it was more of a thing of you need to be a good person you need to be a good hang you don't need to be lousy around people yeah. and it was that same thing i told them i said you know when you play a one-off gig when you get called to sub i said get in good with the drummer sure become friends i said but that keyboard player and that guitar player i said find something positive to say about what they did that night find something positive yeah. to say about that and follow up with an email or it doesn't have to be hey call me it can just be like you know i really enjoyed playing and that third song there was a solo that you took that i just it really made my night yeah i said you know don't lie but take them out the coffee just be a real person yeah and it and it and it comes across as a genuine yeah. you just want to get to know them sure uh and i found that in turn that has gotten me a lot more work than than any self-promotion i've done yeah yeah that's true you know you can beat the walls and and you can be aggressive and pushy and whatever you want to be but that doesn't mean anything if, if you're not a great player or at least not fitted to the situation that comes up or in the eyes of the person that's doing the calling right so right and uh, i've known guys that are have great reputations but other musicians don't enjoy playing with them at all. So right. they'll fade from the whole thing a little quicker than somebody else who's just a reliable friend and somebody that easy to get along with and you know brings a lot to the table. Yeah, there's nothing worse than a bad hang on the road. There's there's oh. nothing worse than a negative bad yeah. hang, you there's know. There's nothing worse. Um Let's see here. There's there's a question. I was waiting for how long this one would take uh, from Will Bartlett. Uh, question for Ronnie. Can you talk us through your gear? How and why have you changed what you use uh, over time? Well, I think you change according to the, the situation you're in. Mm -hmm. uh, you have, well, let's talk about live as, as opposed to studio. In studio situations, I rarely, I'm kind of known to being a double bass drum guy. Mm -hmm. I started that in... Uh, in 69 with Elvis. See, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of known. Uh, some people say that I'm the first American rock and roller mm -hmm. to, to play double bass Double drums. bass. Yeah. Of course, there were a lot of... Uh, of course, Louis Belson was a double baser, but he was, player, he was a jazz right. player. Big man stuff. And then guys like Ginger Baker were on across the pond. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I was evidently the first notable guy... Uh, of guy of note that that played the double bass drums and mm -hmm. I never really practiced them, but I I had a set that had two bass drums in it. And <laughs> you I've always to wanted to try this, <laughs> so if I'm ever going to try it, I better do it with Elvis, you know, because <laughs> he loved drums and he loved to stand right in front of them and feel them. So I thought this would be the great opportunity to do it. So sure enough, I had uh, two different sizes: a 22 and a 20, and put the 20 cool. on my left, the 22 on my right, and being right-handed and uh, right-footed uh -huh. so uh, anyway it uh, it worked out pretty well and i've done that mostly live studio on the other hand uh i use anywhere from a three to four piece set and mm -hmm. and even some some producers will call you because they want that sound of uh particularly a particular time in la they wanted the sound of the uh the, the eight the wraparound you know <laughs> all of that stuff you know <laughs> 
So uh, now, yeah. is there? Are, do you uh, endorse a particular company? I see you're wearing a DW hat. Are yeah, you with I've DW? been with DW since the early '80s. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. Pisces symbols. Okay, Pisces symbols. Yeah. And what sticks do you use? They're all uh, Kaleido, Regal Chip. Okay, very yeah. nice. Yeah. And um, did you tell me you you, you use nylon? The I use both. I use their wood tips and their nylon tips okay. for different situations. Now there was a story I think I remember you telling me about playing with Elvis and maybe it was it one of your tips came off. Yeah. St- <laughs> yeah, one about. of the nylon tips. We were in the middle of hot and heavy in a in a song and and for some reason the the tip of the nylon the, the nylon tip flew right across the top of the set and right went zoomed right past his ear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he did one of those and looked around at me, and since the song was over, he said, Ronnie, you're, you're firing at me or something like that, man. <laughs> thought you were shooting at me. I made a joke of it, but uh, I felt pretty bad. <laughs> now, is there, um, this one is from Tim Krakowski. Uh, when did you know drumming would be your career? Was there an aha moment? Was there, a, you know, did the clouds open up and angels sing, <laughs> or was it just kind of a, something that you began to? Well, very briefly, I was a trumpet player. Uh, started in grade school and played up to about my junior year, a year in high school and decided to take my trumpet in and trade it in on a drum set. I was frustrated mm-hmm. because the trumpet was not allowing me to express myself in the way that I felt like I needed to. Right. And that was through, through drumming, through rhythm. And so the aha thing never really happened for me. It was a gradual movement because when I got out of high school, I was a relatively new drummer. And uh, deciding to, to attend the University of North Texas, where guys had been playing since they were eight, nine years old, you know, right. and, and great accomplished players. Yeah, that's a that's a killer school. Yeah, a... yeah. So it's like sink or swim. So uh, I couldn't even imagine making my living playing drums, but but you just stay at it and and uh, do the best you can. I was going to say it relates to to uh, music because I read a lot of music scores and. Uh, music through uh, singing. Mm-hmm. I was in the a cappella choir at school for, you know, four years. And and uh, so being able to read music and uh, and re- read trumpet music really helped when it came to reading the charts and the rhythm charts that were made at, right. at the University so of So you came, you came uh, from a melodic background before you even kind of yeah. delved into the rhythm. Yeah, I was not a drummer. So to speak, I right? knew there was something wrong with you. Ron. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew, I knew I, I smelled a fish in here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I always tell guys, I said, hey, try to be a musician first. Right. You know, there's lots of drummers. You know, yeah. lots of guys that can uh, beat on drums, as they say. Right. But uh, there's not too many guys that are that take it to its fullest length, which is uh, like some guys I know that are great. Uh, other they play really well at other instruments, or they're great arrangers mm-hmm. or writers. Right. Yeah. That's uh, you talking about being musical. I remember um, when I was in university, I walked up on, there used to be, I don't know if you've seen a lot of gospel drumming, but it's it's almost like this speed oh, yeah. endurance just. Oh, yeah. So I walked in on one of their sheds they were having, and they were, you know, swapping on the kit and doing their licks, and I stood back there for a while. Amazing. I couldn't, you know, I... I... <laughs> So one of my buddies came up and I was chuckling and he said, what is it? I said, I can't do that. <laughs> he said, you can't. I said, no. <laughs> I said, I can't do that. I said, but my whole weekend's booked. <laughs> I said, so, you know, it's, and that's what I try to get into students is um, even if we're learning some kind of, you know, way to go through linear stickings or you're learning some complex African pattern, or, I always tell them, okay, well, take that and find a way to use it on the gig, you know, find a musical, don't just learn it for the sake of learning it. Mm. Um, did you find that your time at UNT, uh, at North Texas, did you find that um, it was, Would do you feel your career would have gone the same way if you hadn't have attended UNT, or do you feel that? No, I don't think it would, because the, the, the connections that I made there <clears throat> with the individual musicians and, and the exposure and the right. chance to, to play and push, push yourself, like I say, sink or swim. Right. I mean, I had to all of a sudden, at that time, you had to be a member of the marching band to to attend to attend the, to, to attend the school. I mean, as a music student. Right. So to play jazz, you had to you had to march with the. <laughs> we had a three hundred piece marching band, which was pretty Huge. cool. Yeah, you know, pretty cool. And uh, but here I was, a guy who had just barely taken up drums, and there were three NARD rudimental champions in the drum line. Wow. 
So I wasn't good enough to even play the snare drum line. I had to end up playing tenor drums, you know, learning to twirl t- tenor sticks with the, <laughs> the little wrist things, you know, right. just to be in the band. But I had to be. You know. Right. To, to go there. Yeah, so, to go. So, so the connections, huh? So, um, yeah. And, and you're right. Uh, everybody has some strength. I learned that when I went to Memphis. Uh, there's guys down there that couldn't even play a, a fill, but they could sit there and groove all night long right blow you away with the solidness of the what they played and the sound and the touch they had they found something that worked for them that's i learned i almost had to relearn everything i learned at north texas right you know to 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 relate to what they were doing in memphis wow now did you live in memphis or yeah five and a half years How how long ago was that in the 60s. Okay. How long have you been in Nashville? I guess I forgot to ask 20 that. years. 20 years. Which do you prefer? That was a question from one of the guys. Which do you prefer, Nashville or... or... Well, uh, it's a different music scene. Completely right. different. L.A. is even a different music scene. I was out there a lot of years. <clears throat> uh, if I had to rely on Nashville as my main source of income, uh-huh. I couldn't. Couldn't? I, I couldn't. Right. I'm a bit right now in this particular part of my career. I'm I'm in the Neil Diamond business. Mm-hmm. I'm in the Elvis Presley business. Right. Still do a lot of work with with both of those. And those aren't bad businesses not to be. Bad. In, by no, the no. Way. I'm not subject to what's going on in Music Row. Right. Uh, here in Nashville. And that's now let's let's talk about that because we I've had a lot of um uh, one of the questions from it was uh, Marcus or John I forget. Um, asked, you know, what advice would you give to someone coming into the music industry? How has it changed? What does it look like now, in other words? Mm. Well, from what from what I see, I think it looks very difficult for a great many people. Mm-hmm. There may be some select few that, that can get into production and use technology, you know, and so forth, but, man... The days, it was a special time when we were out in L.A. because there were maybe a dozen guys, 15, doing the majority of the recording mm-hmm. that was out there. Mm-hmm. These guys are doing three, four sessions a day, no no less than two usually. Right. Week after week after week, you know, and it just went, it went on and went on. And then it's not there anymore. Right. It's not, and that's, I was explaining that to someone, you know, they, they said, uh, I, I was going to a session and I was talking to him. He was in town. I said, well, you know, if I had known you were here, you could have come. Oh, and I'd love to see in the studio. And I said, well, you know, you never know what the studio is going to be like because my band, whenever we were on Universal, we uh, qu- cut at Quad Studios, which is a fantastic studio. Sure. And we, we looked at Sound Kitchen and several others. But then my, uh, you know, the singer in our group, he ran a business. He made six figures a year and he worked out of his home. He had two small rooms. He flew everything out to separate studios. They threw it back to him. And in his there small room, a little bit bigger uh, than the one we're actually taping this in, he mixed everything. And yeah. that was what he did. And he made a very good living, but he could work with anybody worldwide. You know? Right. Um, whereas, uh, you know, what you're talking about, the days of. Yeah, freelance calls, you know. Yeah. I mean, we. <laughs> it's a strange thing to talk about right now, but we had answering services. In the studios, we had a uh, a yellow, kind of a mustard-colored yellow uh-huh. phone, and there was a baby blue phone. Really? And there were two different phone services, and you'd go after, on the breaks, you'd go out and you'd pick it up and say, this is Ron Tutt, anything for me. Really? Yeah. And then, just a minute, you know, yeah, you have a two o'clock tomorrow at so-and-so and so-and-so, you know. And, that's, and that's amazing. And that's the way we functioned. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, you say we, you, and, and who well, were some of the other drummers at that time that were getting uh, a good, well, good number? Well, uh, let's see. Well, let's see. There was Jim Keltner, of course, and uh, Hal Blaine, and mm-hmm. and uh, Jim Gordon was there before we were, and uh, he was there for a brief amount of time. Ah, oh, gosh, who else? I can't think of it. Ed Green, a little bit. Uh huh. Yeah. And that was in L.A. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's get to another question here. Let's see. John Vivian asks, "What single addition to your practice repertoire?" Uh, have you perceived to be the most beneficial? And that can be currently or that can be um, before. I would say what I usually do to warm up with, it's not necessarily relating to the set, but just keeping my hands Mm -hmm. uh, would be the rudiments. Mm -hmm. I always rely on the rudiments. Yeah. You know, warming up with them, you know, taking them slow and then 
slowly increasing them. Mm -hmm. And that's, we do, we talk a good bit about not only the rudiments, but as uh, coming from rudimental snare drumming and, and being around a lot of them, Dr. John Wooten, he went to UNT as well. Um, he was rudimental snare drum champion. So he's a big rudimental guy. And uh, all the guys around me were rudimental guys. And I would take them and I'd slowly break them out and start to put them on the drum kit. Yeah. And I tell people, I say, you know, if I'm going to have to run through these rudiments all the time, I might as well be able to uh, put them around the drum kit and, and begin to express yourself with them. But the, yeah, yeah. The, I always encourage the students to, you know, learn as many of the rudiments as, because that's another thing they say, do I really need to know the rudiments? I said, well, you don't have to. No, I said, no. but it, why not? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, it's stickings that you constantly use. It's fundamentals, so to speak, just like horn players have to practice scales. Right. They don't just sit down and practice, uh, solos. No. Yeah. You know, they practice scales. So that when they do play a, a solo, it, they're totally uh, familiar if, with with the, the motion of of what they're doing and how you right. relate to what what you're playing at that time, and the rudiments can do that through the drum set. I mean, there's been books written over the years about drum set playing with uh, with the rhythm, rudiments and so uh -huh. forth. I've really never read any of them, but <laughs> I just <laughs> it's just what works for me. You know? Right now, give us uh, give us some more because um, we talked a little bit about Elvis. We talked about uh, a little bit about Neil. Now, what are some other artists that you've that you've worked with? Uh, well, I was a member of the Jerry Garcia band. Really? Yeah, and uh, there were uh, four or five of us playing on and off, and uh, yeah, we did a lot of gigs around the West Coast. Uh huh. Some uh, some countrywide tours, but mostly it was uh, studio albums and uh, hanging out on the in the Bay Area. Right, that's that's great. Let's see. I'm trying to I'm trying to peel through these questions as they're coming in. Tom Betka asks, "What's your most memorable Elvis moment or Neil moment? One of the two. Well, just to break it down quickly, I would say the most memorable one would be the Elvis moment would be the Aloha from Hawaii, the satellite live thing around the world. Right. Somebody wrote me recently, uh, congratulations on the anniversary, it's 40 years ago or something like that. You're the first drummer to ever be, ever be seen live around the world. Really? So That's amazing. Now I never it, think of it personally. I always think right. of it as Elvis. You know? er, right. But, but uh, yeah, he's right. Now, so. now that's that to me that's amazing because that was you were the first drummer to do live and now it's come so far that that um technology has come so far oh. that we're we're sitting here we're around the world now yeah never <laughs> in my i mean we have people from australia we have people that have gotten up in the middle of the night by the way in australia and england and uh europe and uh, uh belgium india and they've all told me they're going to be watching what's that like to see kind of the progression of how this technology has affected what we do whether it be teaching or playing or or what not? Well, I think it's it's raised the bar. I think it's influenced in a positive way as far as the art of music and drumming. Right. I really think so. I, I think uh, there's so many great players out there now and so many ways uh, to study and develop things, doing like what you're doing, such as your program. Uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for, for guys to not be so insulated, so insular in, in what they subjected to right and now is a chance to just hook up to like i say satellite availability and we can learn from from all the different cultures right and that's you know i never imagined i, I told somebody earlier i never imagined that i would go through drumming go through school where you learn all about drumming and they didn't teach me a thing about technology and then I'd have to go in to learn how to make my own website and i would get on a place called youtube and put up some lessons <laughs> and start going you know, okay, well, these people want to learn from me. How could I better? And it just kind of snowballed into, you know, this type of thing. Yeah. Um, it's just amazing to me how that can how that can work. Let's yeah. see. Let's see if we can get a couple. Um, David, you too, David, off of the chat board says, "Do you feel you can still learn at the same pace as you did when you were younger?" Uh, I think we can be influenced. Mm -hmm. I mean, learning is a process. I'm I'm not. It's almost like a thinking of yourself as a constant student. I like to think of yourself as a constant person who's willing to learn. Right. Uh, I don't know necessarily sometimes what you studying does definitely help you with what with applies to what you're doing. But, right. But on the other hand, just listening to other people and other groups and other musicians and particularly other drummers on 
things like you said, YouTube and th mm -hmm. those kind of things. It's still amazing. I hear drummers I've never even heard of play stuff that blows me away. Right. You know. And and that's I, and where did I, they learn this? You know? <laughs> yeah, where, where did they come from? You know? Where did this five year old come from? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's amazing. You know, I I have been looking into some some West African drumming lately, and it's always you know I always think, oh, okay, I've I've got a handle on what's in the out in the world, and really, if you you know, yeah. don't close yourself because there's us being here in Nashville. I constantly have to tell people they say all oh, country music. I say don't close your ears to it. Please don't close your ears to yeah. it. I said, you know, it's a, it's a valid musical form. I said, when you start closing off music avenues and forms, I said, you really limit yourself to what you're. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the first music I actually made a, a Bach plan was playing a Western swing. Really? Yeah. With Western swing band. And, uh, which is kind of like jazz, but also very simple, like Dixieland. And the fact that it's two beat mm -hmm. or polka or whatever, any f basic form of, music you know that's simplistic mm -hmm. and there's still a challenge to do that well there is there's, yeah. there's an art to playing everything i tell people there's an art to you can make an art out of anything you can yeah. dismiss anything and you can make an art out of yeah. anything if you want i always say learn how to do it well before you criticize it right right you that's, know study it learn it that's and a great you, point then you have a then you have a, 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 an objective viewpoint then right now this this has come from a couple people uh marks with k i have to say that so i know which one it is um as well as david and um uh, tony asked this um what were some of your biggest two-part question what were some of your biggest influences coming up and then recent uh, as in the past couple of years what are some of your biggest influences on artists you listen to for inspiration well <clears throat> as far as drumming is concerned i th I, th I think it's really important to pay tribute to <clears throat> the drummers that brought drums out from behind the back of the bands right <laughs> and i think we have people like gene kruba to thank for that oh know? yeah he he and buddy rich uh regardless of personality differences uh really brought drums to the front you know right. they were popular with uh, not only the fans but they became part of music i mean right. th th their playing became a big part of the of the music of that time and there were several different guys like that, but particularly Gene, because he had such passion for playing. He heavily influenced me because I always thought, man, if I ever get to play like that, I, that's the kind of way I want to play because you felt his heart and you felt his soul. Right. He wasn't just a tech bl blazing speed. and That wasn't his deal. You yeah. Know, there's, there there's was guys out there that like that now that are all f speed, but I don't sense a lot of soul heart. and heart from him. So I, I, you know, one of the things that, that I remind myself constantly is, um, be in the moment, no matter what you're playing, even if it's, you know, the worst situation you've ever felt like you can be in, if you can find one thing to put you in the moment and, and remind you while you're there, that comes across in your playing. Do you find that to be true? Yes, definitely. So definitely. So I used to, people used to say, man, you're coming all the way into LA. Cause I, I would be like a two hour drive away living in the mountains and you're coming all the way in for a one hour jingle. And I'd say, yeah, it's a challenge to do this one hour jingle just as much as it to do a major project. Absolutely. With, with a major artist, you know, right. It's a challenge for you to do this well, to make, like you say, make it art. Right. Now, did you, uh, let's go ahead and finish up that question. Uh, who are some of your current influences? Oh, current ones. Uh, oh man, it's hard to, it's hard to say. Because like I say, there's lots of guys, the young players that come out that have so much chops. And are there any artists that, that necessarily, even if it's not drummers, are there artists that you find you listen to for inspiration and, and that kind of nourish your musical soul, if you will? I wouldn't say not one particular one. I would just say over the years, the music I've listened to to relax with are now pretty much dated. But I would say guys like James Taylor, you know, mm -hmm. the way... I'm, I'm friends with a lot of the guys that have played a lot of that music, so I relate not only to the friendship with those individuals, but to the type of music it is. Right. Because I have a tendency to, when I listen to music, not to want to listen to the most hyper-aggressive stuff that there is. Right. I like the things that cool me out, because I get enough of that live. <laughs> Playing live. <laughs> Playing live. So, uh, yeah. So that's, um, that's more where I'm at. A question from me, uh, personally. You listen to Elvis's music, and we just refer back to that because you know you're kind of known for playing on a lot of of what he did. Um, 
listening to his music, it has a different feel to it on the drums. It's not quite swung and it's not quite straight. There's this push and pull that I a lot of, a lot of times hear in, in his music, especially from the rhythm section, um, where it seems like it's it, it feels great, it's grooving, but it feels like it's just fighting that kind of like New Orleans that teeters on that line of yeah. is it swung or is it, and, but in a different way. Um, what's it like trying to recreate that that feel and 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 what well, did that feel come from? What do you think? Well, I, I think it's opinion. just exposure to different kinds of things that you've done in your life. Uh, there again, I've played with enough piano players that played that New Orleans style, mm-hmm. where they where they one hand's kind of swinging, and you know the, the the feel, the shuffle feel, and the other one's playing more of a stiff eighth thing. You know, uh-huh. guys like a little Richard, right? You know, when you or, or Dr. John or, or a couple of. Uh, piano players I worked with are from that area that New Orleans is famous for that I developed a left hand technique that's kind of like that myself it's where it's where it's a kind of a drag thing with uh-huh. my left hand or I'm almost duplicating what I'm doing with the right but I but it's almost like a New Orleans thing really that I do so uh I, it's because I've admired it right and and it just evolve naturally that way now there's that is another one of the questions i don't remember i'm trying to dig through there's there's tons of questions i'm trying to dig through who actually wrote this but i remember reading it is there any one thing that you go yeah that's ron tut that's that's it, you know you listen to your recording you go yeah that's what i that's something that i do that's something that i um well i th- i think some of that might come under the heading of uh the kind of fills that i've developed over the years uh, uh particularly when it comes to toms mm-hmm. i've uh i was heavily influenced by a drummer that played in new orleans for quite a while but he was an la guy his name is jack sperling and he tuned his toms very low very mm-hmm. deep and very melodic sounding and i always admired that greatly and, and i had a chance to spend a couple of long phone calls with him and great mentor so anyway I've I've decided to tune my drums that way, and uh, Paul Lyme does the same thing. And so, really? so I really when I hear a song with, that has that sound of of the lower those deep sounds of of toms, I, I recognize my myself or at least my my approach. As right. Well. That's what that's I would do, did. or that's what I did. Right. Right. Yeah. Very cool. This goes back to uh, Jeff Lerner's asking from the Jerry Garcia group. Um, he says, obviously, they did a lot of jamming. Uh, can you talk about the importance of listening to your bandmates while you're playing? Are you thinking more about what you're doing or about what they're doing? Well, I think it's more about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, with that particular band, with the Garcia band, it was very much like a jazz ensemble in the fact that the songs had a head, if you will, an opening. Right. And uh, and then it then solos. And everybody was free to play as many solos as they wanted. Right. Whoever wanted to, except I never considered myself a great soloist. Uh So I was there as a support player. I was there as a team player. Mm -hmm. So I was there to back up those guys. I don't can't remember ever playing a stop drum solo. Listen to the drums. So that the years that I played with that band and and uh, however with Elvis, he wanted us to do that every once in a while. Right. But on the other hand, um, I think that's a role that you have to be willing to take. Mm You know, you don't necessarily have to be overplaying all the time, hung up into what you're doing. You have to be able to, I mean, you're fundamental. So you have to be able to be a good timekeeper and and, uh, and and support what everybody else is doing. Right. What's that uh, What's that joke? What's the quickest way to clear the room? And it's give the drummer a solo. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is from Tealman. He says, uh, Tealman said he was late. Ah, Tealman, you're late. <laughs> <clears throat> Do a tardy slip later. Uh, this was, Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to play with Johnny Cash? And somebody says, happy belated birthday. Apparently it was just Oh, birthday. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last month, yeah. We're in April now. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah uh, I can only say that Johnny, I only did a Christmas album with Johnny. Okay. Uh, yes, but, but it was here in Nashville, and it was a great experience. Uh, he was a really mellow, easy-to-talk-to guy. And mm-hmm. uh, his son, actually, uh, Jack. Uh, no, I, I, let me let me start that again. The trombone player with the Memphis Brass, Memphis. Okay. Me, the Memphis Horns mm-hmm. uh, was uh, was the trombone player was Jack Hale. His son did all the arrangements. Really. Yeah. So it was it was a cool deal to be able to play with Jack's son and 
play some of his music and arranging. Anyway, Johnny was really cool. He even brought us uh, a bag of figs that he had just picked from his trees. <laughs> he's, he's really into eating healthy, you know, at that point. But it was it was a cool guy to hang with. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, let me get a couple more questions here before we got to get out of here. Um, let me dig through one we haven't had yet. I, I have one I want to ask because I always I always like to hear the stories. What's your most embarrassing moment on stage? Uh, who was it with? Where was it? You know, because uh, you, you remember would... those. You remember every detail. Uh... You remember what they were eating on the front row. You remember <laughs> everything about it because it goes in slow motion. Nobody knows that, but time can slow down when this oh, happens. Oh man, this is going to come back to haunt me, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I just watched one of those guitar session uh -huh. things on TV, and uh, Jeff Beck. Uh huh was there with uh, Vinny uh, Kelly and, and, and all the great players. And anyway, um, it was with uh, George Martin, uh -huh. the Beatle producer and arranger <laughs> at the Hollywood Bowl. And we were playing Beatle songs, uh -huh. all of George's arrange arrangements, which was great fun. You right. know, to be able to play all these charts and that you've heard all these years, you know, and actually be able to be a part of it. Right. Know? Then we got to a section of the show where Jeff Jeff Beck had written a song, and it was all in 5-4. And I'll be honest with you, we got lost <laughs> in the middle of it. You know, it got to be this flowing thing, and the sound was weird, and you couldn't really hear, and... And we're, I, I'm looking around. There's all these eyeballs, that, like panic on <laughs> like every this rhythm. Big. Yeah, rhythm section. So I go, where are we? Where are we? <laughs> we're going, where's one? You know. <laughs> and we just totally screwed it up terribly. I mean, I, 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 that's one that haunts me to this day. You know, it, it's like, oh my god, a live recording. You know. And, oh, and it's down on tape forever. You know. I you guess <laughs> <laughs> somewhere they yeah. threw it away. <laughs> yeah, with Pro Tools, they could have straightened it right out. Oh yeah, <laughs> we'd have fixed it. We'd have flown in another <laughs> part. In, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, that's a, I, I had a piano player. I used to do a lot of the symphony stuff with. And he talked about whenever, because he was very adamant when we were playing that you had to fix it right then. And he said, it's like you're flying a plane and you're fine. And then all of a sudden you're in the trees and you got to pull up. <laughs> he said, that's how you used to describe yeah, it. So yeah. that's that's great. Oh, yeah. Let's get one or two more. Um, this is a good one. This is a good one. from a, This is actually from a drum teacher out of Texas, Marcus. Um, how important is it for drummers to understand finances and the, and the business side of things? Well, some of the most successful drummers and musicians I know do have a very good understanding of finances and business. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I personally think it would be a, a, a recommendation that you take a course of that, whether it be online or whatever it is, or at mm -hmm. the college if you're attending school or whatever. Really need to know it. You really need to know some basic fundamental principles right. uh, of uh, Seems like you know, out of every dollar you make, you take you know, you pay your taxes and you take ten percent. Put right. in, you know, all those good things to to know fundamentally, because there'll be a point where uh, you wish you had more than just being able to live from day to day. Right, you wish you would have put some of that. You aside. Wish you'd put it aside. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, that's, I had a uh, a good friend who played with um, Ellis Marsalis and uh, Delfeo Marsalis and several of those, and he saved for years. And he was a business major and a music minor. Mm -hmm. And um, I really think that the the business side of the thing is what has caused him to do so well. Because whether feast or famine, he said, "I'm on a budget. I have the same every month." He said, "If it's good, it's great. If it's bad, I have to go into savings." But mm -hmm. uh, you know, it really opened my eyes at the time to, you well, know, yeah, because there's always stuff that will raise its ugly head, mm -hmm. things that you're just not prepared for. So by learning to budget and putting things down that that that, that are classified under your overhead is very very important right yeah. now um one other question kind of related to that um give the reality of road work so i have a lot of of students that email me and talk about you know well, i want a tour and i want to do this and i said well you know it's good that you want to do that now i said but if you thought you know, 20 years down the road if you thought into this how that plays into family life how that plays because eventually you're gonna maybe want a wife or maybe even a girlfriend or yeah. you know kids or and and how it's a part of life. Yeah. How does how does how has road work and and that 
Um, has it taken a toll on the family? Have you been able to balance it pretty well? Well, I think it's it, it definitely takes its toll on a family situation. Because uh, when you're at a certain age, you don't have those responsibilities and you don't have the men- mentality, you don't have those aspirations. Mm-hmm. You just want to go out and have a good time and play music and, you know, do the thing. But on the other hand, uh, there'll come a time where you'll realize that your family is very, very important. And some of the things out on the road are are not necessarily constructive right. to family life. Right. And uh, it's really, really important to find a balance in your life of, uh, of the... Uh, the uh, emotional, spiritual, all the different things you have to find that keeps you level and balanced, and yeah. balanced out there because right. there's lots of distractions, I'll say. Right. And uh, so it's, it's, it's important to, uh, to have an understanding of what is out there. Uh, and I've gone through all th- everything from that maybe some of you guys are going through right now, hauling the drums around in a van with a few other buddies, you know, right. doing gigs. I've done that as well as hauling my own drums up to the point to where, you know, we have techs, have cartridge companies that haul your drums for you now. With Neil, we and, and with with the big screen thing with with Elvis, we do the, uh, we have we have drum techs. Mm-hmm. So I never really see my drums until I walk on stage for the sound check, and there they are. You right, know? and. Uh, and with with Neil right now, and with the Elvis show, I've been very very fortunate uh, to allow my wife to be able to go on the road with. Oh, me. really? Yeah, that's great. So I've been able to do that for the last uh, ten years or so, and wow. so that's like having a little slice of home with me. <laughs> with so, you, yeah, yeah, it makes it easier. Oh, uh, yeah, it makes all the difference in the world. So, uh, so I can keep on doing it as long as I want to do it. Otherwise, I'd have to take a hard look at it at this point in my life. Right. Um, we're going to have to wrap things up, uh, but I wanted to you to kind of leave them. If there was a piece of advice you could give to, whether they be a music teacher, somebody that's actually on the road right now, or just a student that's 15 and, you know, wanting to get better at it. Uh, we have the weekend hobbyists. We have all kinds in here. Yeah. What, what piece of advice would you just give to them? Well, I would just say... Um, Develop a passion for what you do, what, no matter what level it is, um, and let that be the, le- you know, let that be the guiding thing that that, that, that motivates you, is your your desire to understand that playing to whatever level you're at is a gift, right? And and develop that gift as best you can, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming. I know yeah, all man. the guys do, uh, and girls as well. 